Great. Thank you again. And um, this is such a great session talking about how people like to treat uh, scoliosis. So I'm going to get a little controversial. I see about 10 uh, deformity patients a week in my clinic, and I will probably operate on one in about 20 of them, uh, at least in the way that you're typically thinking of. So let me first put it in context that uh, there's a real issue in terms of how people are treated. We heard it yesterday about the geography of treatment, that people are being treated more in the cities and in certain situations where there may be a more likelihood of having surgery in certain pockets, maybe because there's less likely uh, to be sued or maybe the reimbursement's better. So there's a lot of variability in terms of how people are being treated in any given country. In addition, we know that the population is aging, so we've already heard folks discuss the issue of, wow, you know, scoliosis is common, diseases are becoming more common, and the patients are actually older and sicker and more frail. So, you know, this is a very important point as we look at the, uh, the uh, aging of the population and people over the age of 100. So, so right now, over 60,000 people in the U.S. are over the age of 100. So let me just see a show of hands. How many of you in this room have operated on someone over the age of 90? Over the age of 90. Yeah, so maybe about a third of you, right? So be prepared for this tsunami of people that are coming that are 100 years old because they're going to be coming to your clinics, right? And you can see that there's been a significant growth in the amount of surgery being done. It's been about a doubling in the amount of surgery in uh, the U.S. over the last 10 years or so. And that's a trend that's going to continue. So this is a really important issue. So the question was, how do I treat adult deformity? And the answer is, I always try and do less or the least amount amount possible in every single case. And we've heard people discuss already that every single patient is unique and they're absolutely right about that. So how is this accomplished? So I'm going to go over four ways. One is picking a non-fusion option over a fusion option. The second is using less hardware, not more, because the trend now is to do more and more and more. More screws, more rods, more cement, four rods, six rods, kickstands, four iliac screws, all of that, more and more and more and more. I'm saying do less and less and less fewer levels and doing this minimally invasive. So first non-fusion treatment. So here's an example of a lady, 66 year old woman, wife of one of our doctors, infectious disease doctor who comes in, sorry, pediatrician, comes in and has foraminal stenosis. She's had this scoliosis largely all her life. The first thing she says to me is, do not treat my scoliosis. I don't need it treated, I only have leg pain. And so what do we choose to do? We do a very selective approach, endoscopic decompression, to minimize the amount of facet removal, to minimize the amount of iatrogenic destabilization, this surgery pays very poorly in America. Nobody else is gonna offer her this surgery, right? But we did this surgery and this is the result that the leg pain completely resolves and she can get good relief and you've heard enough about endoscopy already yesterday and today, but the bottom line is it has a role even in the setting of deformity because you disrupt less of, of the patient. How about less hardware, okay? How about just putting in less metal and plastic and carbon fiber and all that, right? So here's an example. This is a lady who came in. She had a history of a Harrington rod put in when she was younger. Then another surgeon did an X lift plus percutaneous screws at L45, leaving one segment of the spine remaining, just this one last segment in here remaining. So what did we do? We simply put the screws and rods and a lift that could accomplish this. Single level hyperlordotic cage at L5S1, that's all it took. This lady works in our hospital. She delivers equipment. This surgery was 10 years ago, and the idea is not to mess with anything else. The less you do, sometimes the better. People have already tried to do a lot to her. We can get a lot by doing less and putting in less metal. It costs less money. There are fewer complications. How about fusing fewer levels? This is a principle that, again, everybody else is talking about fusing more and more and more and more. So we had Dr. Patel and I were having lunch, and I was telling him that I've never done a T4 to pelvis. I do the most deformity next to Harry Shuffleberger in the city of Miami, but I've never done a T4 to pelvis because when someone gets a PJK at T4, they get paralysis 50% of the time. When they break a T10, they're gonna have pain and you're gonna have to revise them. So why do I wanna start with the surgery that gives them a 50% chance paralysis when they break off above? Think about it for one second. Would you do it? And I always think about Jurgen Harms. When Jurgen Harms has his spondylolisthesis, when he was symptomatic, what do you think he had done? Jurgen Harms. 
non-fusion, right? So I'm not anti-fusion, I'm pro-fusion, right? So this is a great quote from Tony Tenori. He said, the goal is not to make the patient 18 years old again. The goal is to make them the day they were before the pain was unbearable. So here's another lady comes in with a deformity. We just do a single level T lift for the level of olesthesis, right? And minimization is a good strategy because it reduces the rate of iatrogenic problems. It is better for the frail or ill patient. We've heard about frailty already. It reduces complications. It's more palatable to the hospital's budget. It attacks the problem piecemeal, and the patient can live to fight another day. You can always do more surgery. You cannot unoperate. You cannot undo what you've done. So everybody shows the same story, right? Everybody, my worst case, they start out with a one-level fusion somebody else did, then they add on to that, then it breaks down above, and they add on. Every surgeon's shown this talk, right? Another level, another level, another level. It's like my biggest disaster. That's not the biggest disaster. And the take-home lesson for the young people is start with a big surgery, right? If you started with the big surgery would have avoided all the problems. Wrong. That's not correct. And so that's the classic complication. How about the complication of the patient that you do a big surgery on and they die? Okay, that's a real complication that you will, we will have trouble sleeping with. So what about minimally invasive? So this is an interesting way of approaching things. Classic du jour MIS, T9 to pelvis MIS surgery. Sorry, is it better that way? You gotta turn the volume down or something. Um, and then here's what you get. You get basically perk screws put in, and this is the OR time, and that's very standard, right? And the MIS deformity area is growing. It's a field that's expanding. There's over 200 publications now, and there's a lot of advantages. You can get reduced costs. You can get uh, less PJK. You can get clinical improvement. You can get coronal correction, and you can get sagittal correction. I don't have time to go over all the papers because that's just too much, too much time for that. But let me just show you one simple example, right? 64-year-old lady comes in with two years of progressive back and leg pain. This lady's very wealthy. She's what we call in America socialite. She knows everybody. She's beautiful. She was famous when she was young, and she loves to ski and play tennis. She can only walk two blocks. The pain is relieved with rest. Very classic symptoms. She had seen spine centers, academic centers, all over the southeastern U.S. Emory University, Vanderbilt, Georgetown. She went all over the country in the southeast interviewing all the different spine surgeons. And this is what she looks like. You can look at the parameters, right? And she has a fairly mild deformity. This is her pain drawing, right? So. Most of the surgeons recommended, guess what? T4 to pelvis. T4 to pelvis. I couldn't believe it in the university setting. I was like, you're crazy. That is a ridiculous thing to do. You will never ski. You will never play tennis. You'll be lucky to go shopping occasionally if you do a T4 to pelvis. So this is what her MRI looks like. So we agree that we're going to go after the areas with the most pain. And we're going to correct her. We've already heard about it. It was invented here. These are all the options, right? T10, T4, a lift, all these things. Actually, you can do any of these and they'd be just fine. But the key is we're going to come lateral and we're going to go short segment. And this is a standard type of approach. You heard Luis Pimenta talk. He invented a lot of this. This is the K2M system. It's not invasive that allows us to easily access this area. And this surgery doesn't take long and doesn't give a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. But the lady does great. These are her parameters, pre and post-op. And you can see it's not that important. It's not a deformity case. But her ODI goes from 34 to 2, right? And the pros, minimally invasive, you get a robust inner body fusion, reduce adjacent disease, you preserve three motion segments, you get rid of her chief problem, and you reduce the morbidity and you get good coronal correction. But the cons, we've left other levels untreated. We talked about that. We're not going to treat everything. It's two approaches because there's a side approach and a posterior approach. We left a fractional curve untreated and it requires some planning and some radiation exposure, right? She bought my books. She looked it up. She goes, okay, yeah, you're the expert. I'm going to do this small surgery. This lady sends me patients who now travel a thousand miles from Atlanta. They all come from Atlanta now. They pass almost a thousand doctors to come down and see me because she said, you actually listened to my problem. You actually said you weren't going to do T4 to pelvis because guess what? You do T4 to pelvis, you make five times more money in that surgery, right? But treat the person like a human being, right? And here's a very good example of how MIS can really impact you, which is the difference in cost. This is from Rick Fesser's paper. The mean cost of doing the open surgery was 539,000 US dollars at Northwestern University. The mean for MIS surgery was 124,000. So huge reductions, but all these surgeries are super expensive, right? So when do I go long? When there's multi-level arthritis, when there's severe coronal malalignment, 
when there's severe sagittal malalignment, when you need to treat the whole curve for what, whatever various reasons, there's no good stopping point, when there are multiple areas of severe stenosis, and when there's severe osteoporosis requiring multiple areas of, of, of fixation. So again, remember that the results of all these surgeries have to be measured against the gold standard. I think the gentleman from Portugal talked about the gold standard surgery, traditional open operations, that is the gold standard for treatment. So thank you again. It's been a great time in Brazil. Thank you for having me here. Thank you.